Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is entitled, The Least of These, Ministering to Those in Need. And this is lesson number seven in that series, entitled, Jesus and Those in Need, for August 17 of 2019. I think you'll find it a very challenging and provocative lesson as we have. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our loving Father, we come to these sessions that uh, we have an opportunity to share with you here. We recognize your presence with us. And with this lesson and all the challenging ideas that has for us, may we make the most of them and represent you correctly as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll start out by suggesting that this lesson will focus on the truth about Jesus as it relates to the prophecies about him in the Old Testament. We're going to go beyond that, but that's a start. As you remember, uh, Mary was uh, traditionally, traditionally, let me say, this is not stated in the scriptures anywhere, but traditionally Mary had gone to get some water at the well. And there Gabriel appeared to her and said, you know, I have a message for you. And you know the story said, yeah, believe it or not, I know you not married, but you're about to have a baby. And, uh, you know, she almost certainly was a teenager at that time. She was betrothed to marry a man who already had at least, <coughs> at least six children. And uh, it's really interesting. Um, she became pregnant. What, as we know, we'll carry on with the story. But soon after she was received that message, she decided it was appropriate for her to leave her home in Nazareth in Galilee <coughs> and travel down to the hill country of Judea to visit her. And we don't know exactly how they're related. Uh, probably a cousin um, that lived in somewhere not too far from Jerusalem down near Jerusalem, as I said, and um, we're going to talk about what that implies and so forth. The challenge was that even Mary and Elizabeth and John, who was ahead of Jesus, even those people who had been chosen by God had a false idea about what the Messiah was going to do. And uh, Jesus came and his goal was heal the sick, reach out to the needy, raising the dead. These weren't things that the Jewish people really were looking forward to. I mean, you would have thought somebody shows up and I'm, I can raise the dead. Everybody would have been rejoicing, right? They were looking for a Messiah who would lead their armies to help them conquer or throw out the Romans. I'm going to take a moment or two to read a portion of what it says here about the birth of Jesus. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to a town in Galilee named Nazareth. He had a message for a young woman promised in marriage to a man named Joseph, who was a descendant of King David. Her name was Mary. The angel came to her and said, Peace be with you. The Lord is with you and has greatly blessed you. Uh, ladies, I'm trying to think about... I don't know how many of you have lived in places where the women have to go out early in the morning and get the water for the whole family for the whole day and carry it home on their heads. Um, I lived in those kind of places for years in Africa and understand that. But here she was, and she turns around probably from maybe ready to pick up her her pot with whatever kind of a pot was that she had to put on her head. And there's an angel. How would you respond? How did she know it was an angel? Well, and I guess the question is, did he appear as an angel or did he appear like a, a human being? We just don't know. Well, it's just, just a messenger, so yeah. it, it doesn't necessarily have to have wings on it. That's yeah. it. Well, Mary was deeply troubled by the angel's message, and she wondered what his words meant. So the fact that it calls him an angel sort of suggests that he looked like that. The angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. God has been gracious to you. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. Now, you're a young woman, a teenager. You're not married yet. And someone says you're pregnant. 
In <laughs> that <laughs> society. What do you say next? In that society. In that society. Well, mm, yeah, um, you will become pregnant and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High God. The Lord God will make him a king as his ancestor David was. And of course, you know, try to imagine in her mind when, when he says he, he will make him a king, what is she thinking? Getting rid of the Romans. We're going to beat the Romans mm -hmm. as his ancestor David was. And think what David did. And he will be the king of the descendants of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Imagine saying that to someone. Wow. Yeah, in a sense, saying that he will be like David just fed into their yeah. misconceptions about what the Messiah was going to do. So, now, ladies, again, I'm going to turn to you. You've just been told that you're going to be pregnant. Do you go home and tell your parents? Depends on the parents. How, how, what kind of a relationship did she have with her parents? Yeah. No, we don't have any indication that uh, her parents are never mentioned. Was she an orphan? Was she being raised by somebody else? We, we well, I'll, I'll really tell you there is a hint. There's a hint. Uh, and I won't go, go, I won't go into this in, in detail. But if you look at the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew, and then you look at the genealogy of Jesus in Luke, they're almost not, there's almost no word, names that are the same. And scholars have looked at that and they're almost sure that the genealogy in Matthew is traced through Joseph, that Jesus wasn't related to really at all, and that the one in Luke was through Mary. And of course you would expect the doctor to, to be more likely to trace it to, he said, well, he, you know, he, he's a stepfather, he isn't a real father, so we're going to trace it to Mary, and he traces it to Mary. So, and that's not completely surprising because in ancient times, uh, you, you sort of think of Abraham's story, um, not exactly, but um, sometimes if you had only a daughter, you would adopt her future husband as, a quote, your legal son so that he could inherit your property because women weren't allowed to inherit property. Yeah. Well, I'm sure she had parents. I'm just questioning whether they were alive at this time or not. Yeah. Or not. But what I'm saying is the fact that they claim that Joseph was his father suggests that maybe he had been adopted by her parents. Maybe her parents only had one daughter. That, at, that's that, what, at that point in time. That's what I'm suggesting. I, we don't know. I'm just, this is just speculation. But, so, the, but if we look at what Mary did with Jesus... Mm -hmm. as a child teaching him and he didn't wasn't taught in the synagogue she had to have you know some education yes. from yeah health. an amazing amount yes. of education she had to sp speak f and read so, fluently at least two languages when she met gabriel i mean she was surprised but yet it was kind of like i will do whatever mm -hmm. you know she had to have had a close relationship with her parents and with or whoever was teaching her and with God I would think so so what happens next well the next thing we know about she's traveling to Judea do you think a single woman a teenager would dare to travel from Galilee to Judea by herself not if her parents were alive yeah <laughs> well and so the, she was an only daughter yeah, yeah. So, oh. so now we're, it wouldn't be reasonable for her to go by herself. No. But we have no record of who, anybody else going. We probably have a lot of things that we don't have all the, yeah. the rest of There's the story a, on. Lots of exciting things still to learn, aren't there? Well, when she arrived at the home of Elizabeth, it appears that Elizabeth was already somewhat aware of what was coming. And Mary responds with that incredible passage. I'm going to read you. This is Mary's song of praise, Luke 1, 46-55. Mary said, My heart praises the Lord. My soul is glad because of God my Savior, for he has remembered me his lowly servant. Now, the average teenager who's pregnant at that point in time wouldn't be praising anybody. <laughs> you know, obviously this is not the usual situation. But from now on, all people will call me happy because of the great things the mighty God has done for me. His name is holy from one generation to another. He shows mercy to those who honor him. He has stretched out his mighty arm and scattered the proud with all their plans. He has brought down mighty kings from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. 
He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has kept the promise he made to our ancestors and has come to the help of his servant Israel. He has remembered to show mercy to Abraham and to all his descendants forever. Mary stayed about three months with Elizabeth and then went back home. Well, it seems like there's an awful lot of devotion for a teenager. Could she have written that later on, looking back at the way things transpired? It says she's saying that to Elizabeth. To Elizabeth, before <laughs> she had the child. That's what it says. And she probably stayed Sorry until Elizabeth you. had the child. Well, so my my question, yeah? Well, Elizabeth was about six months pregnant. Yeah, and she stayed so three months. Three months. So, yeah. yeah, she probably yeah, tell, well, tell, yeah, stayed until sure. Elizabeth had her child. Yeah. yeah. Well, so the question is this. I ask about those this, the last part of that thing. All it talks about the kings and the, the poor rising up. Those might have been standard kind of thinking of the poor in, in, her, in her day. Maybe she was re- just re- you know, mentioning things that, would, that were fair. I, I don't know. I'm just saying a possibility. But she was special. That's why she was chosen. She That's stood right. up. And what, what was it that made her special? By the way, to God. Okay. Uh, who could put this thing together? Who could put this thing together from the Luke one forty five uh, and all? I mean, this is pretty, pretty amazing. Pretty amazing stuff. How did she know how to where to find Elizabeth? Get on her GPS and. <laughs> yep. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Bush Telegraph. Bush well, how, how big you know a family was to... this, anyway? Uh, we do not know. Elizabeth would have been much, much older because yeah. uh, that was one of the dilemmas of they were mm-hmm. already advanced in years, and yet Mary is a teenager. So, uh, you know, how big a family and how... There's lots of questions to be asked here. Probably a cousin once removed. Yeah. <laughs> My favorite thing about that, though, is that um, God knew she did not have the right understanding of mm-hmm. all that was meant to be. And I think God let her be in her happy bubble. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fair enough. Well, she went somewhere so, near Jerusalem. So yes. do you think that Mary went to Elizabeth and Zacharias to help them? Or did she go to get help for herself? <coughs> yes. <coughs> <laughs> I think probably both. Well, and I think partially she went to get away from the all the, the stuff that would be mm-hmm. said back in, 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 in Nazareth. In Nazareth. Yes. Nazareth wasn't a, a nice, kind place to be. Okay. Dennis, I think you have yeah, some words about Zechariah. They tried to throw Jesus over the cliff. Look, exactly. Up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> when he disagree- said something disagreeable to them. So, Tell us what you know about Zechariah. All right. This is from Desire of Ages uh, 97.2. Zechariah dwelt in the hill country of Judea, but he had gone up to Jerusalem to minister one week in, a, in the temple, a service required twice a year from the priests of each course. Now, we're not going to take time to discuss that, but way back in the days of David, he had divided the priests up into 24 groups. And so you would, you know, you would live in your part of the country doing whatever you did there, ministering to the local synagogue or whatever, but twice a year for a week you would go to Jerusalem and your group of 20, of one of the 24 would take care of everything at the temple during that week. And then you would go back home. And then six months later, you'd go again. So that's what happened. So do you think Mary understood the full implications of that little song that she sang? No. No, I, I, Ellen White talks about us, uh, about people giving, being given a message for their time, but nobody uh, fully understands the gospel, yeah. you know, or the plan of salvation and all. They don't understand... They're each given a message, but they don't under the, understand the message the, and all the full their implications. Yeah. yeah. Do you think she had any idea that what she said was something similar to what Hannah said back in First Samuel two? I'm guessing that she knew a lot about the Old Testament, as we're going to see later. She taught Jesus. Yes. About the Scripture. Well, Hannah was married. 
and had not been able to have a child. And so he married a second wife who had children and she was desperate and she was praying for a child. And she came up with a similar, some way similar song. When we would say became pregnant miraculously, I would say, although I will say that Hannah had, what, six more children after Samuel was born? Mm -hmm. Well, where did Elizabeth get, I mean, sorry, where did Mary get the Elizabeth, information she shared with Elizabeth? Was it something that she had learned personally, as you have suggested, or perhaps had been taught from the Old Testament, another possibility? Or were these common ideas of the poor and humble in Galilee? Many commentators, looking at this message from Mary and how it later applied to the ministry of Jesus, referred to it as an upside-down kingdom. What's an upside-down kingdom? The weak on the top and the yeah. poor, or the strong on the bottom. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much the way, uh, including the rich, the, the all the people who should have power are on the bottom, and the poor and the outcasts and the poor. So why do you think Jesus spent much of his ministry working especially with outcasts, the poor, the needy, as opposed to working with the rich, the powerful, and the Jewish leaders? He could have if he wanted to. They were the ones that were listening to him. They saw their need. Yeah. yeah. The wealthy had no need as far as they were concerned. Mm -hmm. They gave themselves credit for where they were. But when we look at it, though, the wealthy did come to him. Some came by night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Pharisees, he didn't need to go to the Pharisees. Those guys came to him. Mm -hmm. Why should I look for you? And he was invited to absolutely uh, to task gatherers' yeah. houses and things like that. But that wasn't the major amount of time that he spent, as as you pointed out. He yeah. spent yeah. more Big time with his followers. Right. Yeah, like did, a or follower. Did Elizabeth and Zacharias have any idea that Mary was coming? It suggested that they did. What do you think Elizabeth would have said to them? Now remember, at the point where she went to see them, they would, they, she would not have looked pregnant at all. Mm -mm. Right. Mary would not have looked pregnant. Mary would not have looked pregnant. No. Um, I work with some, yeah, several young women who are pregnant down at the clinic. As a large lady, I'm not big around, but I mean, she's just, she's tall is pregnant and she already looks like she's ready to deliver and she isn't due until October. Oh no. Uh, oh, she no, is no. going to have one huge baby. Well, and your husband is really big. Are you sure it's only one? Well, <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's only one. Her first baby was 10 pounds. Oh. That'll give you a hint. Well, I used to be big Amazon. Yeah. Well, this raises a question or makes me think of something that many of us are aware of. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has always been much more successful at reaching the poor and needy than we have been at reaching the wealthy, powerful, or highly educated. Why do you think that is? Same have reason. we really? Have we really? I think about that a lot. I think we're doing better now yeah. with, the, with the local... But we used to be missionaries and all this stuff. Not that there's anything wrong with it. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you look at the statistics, uh, well, even now, you you go to the the more highly educated, more wealthier nations, and our growth rate is very slow. You go to Africa, you go to South America, you go to India, and we're just the church is exploding. Right, right. Well, Mar Mary, as we've already suggested, was a most remarkable young woman. Well, probably still a teenager. We don't know that absolutely for sure, but there's pretty strong hints of that. She was engaged to a man who already had at least six children. How do we know that? Because there are four named uh, children. Look at Matthew males 13, and 15, 15, 15. her sisters. sisters. Yes. Isn't he the carpenter's son? Isn't Mary his mother? Aren't James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas his brothers? Aren't all his sisters living here? So there may have been more than six total. All his sisters... How many is that? At least two. Yes. But what Probably wait, more. Did uh, Mary have any more kids? Like no. Catholic churches, church says no, but, no. but we have no evidence, though. Well, here, here's the evidence uh, that, that scholars would, would come up with. When he's on the cross, Jesus turns to Mary 
and he says, John, please take care of her. Now, there's some evidence that John and James were cousins of Jesus, which would make sense. But if she had her own children, it wouldn't be appropriate for her to tell, give, give her care to, to John, who was not a brother or sister. That would be the argument. Um, so she taught Jesus herself. Very few women in her day in Palestine had any official education. Jesus also had another remarkable teacher. And that was his father, God. Can you read that? About that Jackie's Jackie? Jackie? The, the child Jesus did not receive instruction in the synagogue schools. His mother was his first human teacher. From her lips and from the scrolls of the prophets, he learned of heavenly things. Okay, let's stop and think about the implication right now. The scrolls are in Hebrew. The language of the Jewish people in those days was Aramaic. Mm -hmm. So Mary knew well at least two languages. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, when Jesus was... When they were fleeing Herod... Uh -huh. They went. They probably went to Alexandria. That yeah. would have been the the easiest place to to blend in because there was a thriving Jewish community there. Yeah. Uh, they could have gotten a Septuagint scroll at that time too, because they seemed there seemed to be a lot of. But that would mean now she has to know three languages. Yeah, which she probably did. And her husband uh, Joseph probably knew many because of his trade. Mm -hmm. You know, being up in that area of the country, yeah. he would have been on the border of. Uh, tire and funny okay. and such. Sorry for the interruptions. Go ahead. You guys' interruptions are the best. <laughs> okay. The very words which he himself had spoken to Moses for Israel, he was now taught at his mother's knee. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt again. Imagine, <laughs> think about this. You are the mother of this child, and yet you know that this is not an ordinary child. And you're saying... Uh, did you say this to Moses? Oh, let me say it to you. <laughs> Just think about that. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Could have. As he advanced from childhood to youth, he did not seek the schools of the rabbis. He needed not the education to be obtained from such sources, for God was his instructor. Wow. Desire of Ages, page 70, verse one, uh, uh, paragraph 1. And I can tell you without... We can't take any more time on this, but I can tell you there's other places that say that the angels came and taught him. So after having been gone for some time, Jesus returned to Nazareth. So why did those in the synagogue ask him to read the scriptures and comment, comment on them on Sabbath when his, his first visit after, after beginning his ministry? Margaret? This is taken from Desire of Ages, page 74.2. In his youth... In young adulthood, often in the synagogue on the Sabbath day, he was called upon to read the lesson from the prophets, and the hearts of the hearers thrilled as a new light shone out from the familiar words of the sacred text. And I have read that many times, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think. I mean, how, here's a young, well, young man, let's say, and he reads the scripture. Clearly, he knew how to read it. He reads the scripture, and this opens a new light to the people. How did, anyway, we don't have time to, we can think about this. Sir, you cannot help it, but make one comment. He could not, he did not also want to have any advantage over any kids of his age, of his time, mm -hmm. uh, because then the whole thing would flop. Yes, I mean, his connection with his uh, Abba Father, mm -hmm. that he chose. Uh, well, clearly Jesus had often read the scriptures in the synagogue before, so they recognized his skills. But this time things were very different. Jesus announced to his friends and his family that he was the Messiah. Think about that. Let's read those famous verses, Luke 4. Then Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath he went as usual to the synagogue. Now this is the way Luke begins his gospel story. Prior to that it's just history. Uh, of course this is history about the birth and childhood of Jesus. But He stood up to read the scriptures and was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. 
He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has chosen me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed and announce that the time has come when the Lord will save his people. Okay? And he left something out. What did he leave out? Remember what's in Isaiah 61? He and left vengeance. out and defeat their enemies. And defeat their enemies. Why would he leave that out? Because he came not to destroy life, but to save it. Save it yeah. okay. Well, then they would have said, he's here to defeat the <coughs> Romans. Exactly. Yeah. Well, when, uh, when Isaiah wrote those words, did he was talking about himself, or did he have any, any idea that someday the God of heaven would be repeating his words? Well, Peter says, um, as to this salvation, the pro this is P First Peter 1, 10 and on, uh, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves. So you, a lot of times people... Uh, you know, uh, with a particular method of interpretation, the person has to know everything about what they're saying, yeah. and and this contradicts yeah, that there. Exactly. But you in the in these things which are, uh, but you in these things which are now have been announced to you through whom you have preached the gospel, and uh, by well, I think I lost my train of thought. Okay. In other words, they uh, yeah. they were told that it. It was they Deep were serving things. some somebody yeah, later. Somebody else. Yeah. So at what point in his childhood, youth, early ministry did Jesus recognize that he was going to be promoting an upside down kingdom? I think if you read Desire of Ages, he was doing that as a child. Taking care of the poor. She says he often gave his lunch to somebody else. And so forth. Well, Luke begins with this story of his preaching in Nazareth. Was this Jesus' way of announcing his ministry to the hometown folk? A short time later, after choosing his disciples, Jesus apparently gave some or all of the Sermon on the Mount. We can read in Matthew 5-7. to These three chapters are often described as Jesus' mission statement. How does that fit with these messages from Isaiah and Mary that we are studying? Pretty similar, huh? Well, when John the Baptist was arrested and held in prison by Herod Antipas, Jesus moved his ministry from Judea to Galilee because things were not very friendly in Judea at that point. Sometime later, John's disciples came to Jesus asking if he was a looked-for Messiah or should they be waiting for another. Jesus did not immediately answer the question. Instead, he let them observe his work for much of the day. Why did he do that? To provide evidence instead of a statement. Okay. Demonstrated evidence. Evidence. Margaret, I think you have some words on that. Ellen White explained that John's disciples questioned why, if this new teacher was the Messiah, did, yes. he, did he do nothing to affect John's release? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> These questions were not without effect. Doubts which otherwise would never have arisen were suggested to John. Satan rejoiced to hear the words of these disciples and to see how they bruised the soul of the Lord's messenger. Oh, how often those who think themselves the friends of good men and who are eager to show their fidelity to him prove to be his most dangerous enemies. How often, instead of strengthening his faith, their words depress and dishearten. Wow. The Tsar of Ages, 2.14 and 2.15. Yeah. Well, John, along with many other of the Jewish people, believed that the Messiah would liberate them from the Roman yoke. I mean, you could understand why they would, would want that. So why do you think <coughs> Jesus ignored their plight? Couldn't Jesus have released John from prison if he wanted to? Mm -hmm. He could have, somehow or other. Each, each of us has given a mission, and John's mission, in a sense, was finished. He was the forerunner. How many people can you name that understood Jesus' mission 
before he actually died? Very few. I think Mary Magdalene. Maybe. No. Jesus well, himself. Jesus, Jesus. yeah. What this? Uh, well, she, he says, leave her alone. She's anointing me for my burial. Whether she understood or not, I do not know. But well, if you read Ellen White there at that point in time, she saw what was coming. She, you know, she'd heard some things, and she, she had. There's, there's a hint that you know this might have been stuff that she prepared for the for the burial of her her brother. But we can't say that for sure. But. Uh, here she's thinking, wow, you know, this now this guy has raised my brother from the dead. This, maybe he's going to be the king. Maybe this is the time. And nobody t told him, or the, no place can we find what, what Jesus had to say, that uh, what the efficacy of his death would be. Yeah. All yeah. he said there was to Pilate, well, wh wh what are you, what's your mission? Oh, to bear witness to the truth, mm -hmm. to tell the truth. Yeah. That was his mission. And it seems like Jesus didn't really prepare his own disciples or John's disciples for why he seemed to almost you would matter of factly this is yeah him in prison being well so <laughs> yeah I mean this is the world's best teacher of all time and why didn't he or why couldn't he get this message through to them well and it, his, the message is always so uh, it's not in your face, so to speak. It's it's uh, under. Take the book of Job. We yeah. don't find out what the what the problem is with the book of Job till we get to the last. And all yeah. you get is a statement: "You guys have been telling the truth." Mm -hmm. He doesn't. I, I don't line item it. It just you're not telling the yeah. truth. Do you suppose Nicodemus understood more than some of the others? I hope so. Well, Jesus never asks us to believe without getting adequate evidence. The disciples of John went back to him with more than adequate evidence of the divinity of, of Jesus. Carrie? God never asks us to believe without giving sufficient evidence upon which to base our faith. His existence, his character, the truthfulness of his word are all established by testimony that appeals to our reason. And this testimony is abundant. Yet God has never removed the possibility of doubt. Our faith must rest upon evidence, not demonstration. Those who wish to doubt will have opportunity, while those who really desire to know the truth will find plenty of evidence on which to rest their faith. It comes from Steps to Christ, page 105, paragraph 2. Amen. In Matthew 10, Jesus, it, we're, we're told about the choosing of the disciples. Before you go on. The, in the middle of that paragraph, it says, Our faith must rest upon evidence, not demonstration. Okay. Can you explain how... Yeah. God never uses force. I mean, he could, he could just overwhelm us with the evidence. He doesn't do that. That's what she's trying What's to say. What's the not demonstration part? Well, that's what I mean. Demonstration doesn't say, Okay, here it is in your face. Whether you like it or not, you have to accept it because there's no way to doubt what you're seeing here. I'll tell you an example where he almost did that, and that was the raising of Lazarus. So, but, but it was really well planned. Well, fine, but <laughs> God may have a plan. He, he could have come there even before. We know because it, the whole thing was coming to a climax. Yeah. Well, fairly soon thereafter, after choosing his disciples, Jesus began teaching his disciples and sending them out through Galilee to announce the kingdom of heaven. So, what are, what are all the Galileans expecting? How are we going to beat the Romans, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, Matthew 10, 7 and 8. Gordon? Instead of that, he sa Jesus said, Go and preach. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick. Bring the dead back to life. Heal those who suffer from dreaded skin diseases and drive out demons. You have received without paying, so give without being paid. Wow. Good news Bible. So in the Bible, do we read any point, any, any stories about the disciples healing leprosy and raising people from the dead? Nope. Well, they come back and say this, even the demons were subject to us. So yeah? They, 
unhappy we, about that. They, they may have expounded more than what's recorded there, but... Uh, um. Well, we have a message, a final message to a world that's racing to destruction. We call it the Three Angels' Messages. How do we incorporate this mission of Jesus into our, mess- our Three Angels' Messages? Well, we can say, well, we're, we're big into health-related subjects, so we're doing some healing. We're big into teaching as a church, so we do some teaching. Is that Have we fulfilled our mission now? We have to be sensitive to the people about us. It's not just about information. So if needs arise around us, we need to be able to respond to those because God would uh, responded to our need While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We know, Desire of Ages 350, paragraph 3, Jesus spent more time healing than he did in preaching. And healing was not just an attention getter. He even raised the dead more than one occasion. He healed people on the Sabbath who have been sick much of their lives more than one occasion. John 5 and John 9. After performing such miracles, Jesus could easily have told those who were healed and those connected to them, spread the news. Jesus is the Messiah. Is that what he said? No. Not usually. He said, don't, don't tell anyone. What, what is that? Well, despite Jesus' words of instruction, many of those who were healed immediately began announcing that Jesus was the Messiah. And at one point, around Capernaum, Jesus was, so many people were, were, were saying that he was the Messiah, he didn't dare to even go into the town. He stayed outside because the crowds just, you know, gathering around him and just pressing him, he would have hardly been able to breathe. And the Romans certainly knew mm-hmm. what Messiah meant, and they would have thought, they would have learned from the Jews what that meant, which would have been, yeah. A, a military person, and yeah. that would have... Uh, Caused all things. kinds of problems. Yeah. His time had not yet come. And conquering the Romans was completely out of harmony with what Jesus really wanted to do and teach. So in their shouting his praises, they were likely seriously misrepresenting his mission. So, we have some words about that also. Myra? Yes, from Desire of Ages, page 406, uh, paragraph 4. Every miracle that Christ performed was a sign of his divinity. He was going, he was doing the very work that had been foretold of the Messiah. But to the Pharisees, these works of mercy were a positive offense. The Jewish leaders looked with heartless indifference on human suffering. Can I interrupt for a second? Why did they look at with heartless indifference to human suffering? was the judgment of God on these Yeah, they equated sure. it with... These John people Paul are sinners. You know, let me not get near them, you know. Obvious. <laughs> huh? It's obvious. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. In many cases, their selfishness and oppression had caused the affliction that, Chi- that Christ relieved. Thus, the miracles were to them were a repro- to them a reproach. Wow. So how did the Pharisees cause the selfishness? How did they cause the disease? Was it because was it psychosomatic? Possibly, was it, that's uh, a possibility. Was it the the feelings of uh, I, I'm I'm bad because I'm weak because I'm uh, poor? What about the the widow whose son was dead and he raised him? Maybe they could have caused her husband's death. Uh, stolen a, her property from her, yes. taken advantage of the situation. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I get. I mean, they were really socially, they were very oppressive, mm-hmm. and they were doing bad things under the table, and making devouring, a lot of money at it. Devouring w- widows' houses. Yeah. Yeah. Jim, I think you have some more words about that. In the face of all his wonderful works. They, that is the Jewish leaders, turned away from him and by the beauty of his doctrine and his mercy and benevolence had called thousands to his side who had relieved suffering humanity so that entire cities and villages were freed from disease and there was no work 
for a physician among them. Wow. Imagine that. Of course, physicians then didn't have very much healing power either. No, they didn't. But, I mean, here's, here's someone who's walking with a group of people. And, you know, in those days, there were no medicines or whatever. There were a lot of sick people. Jesus walked through the place and just touched people and spoke words and so forth. And he walks out the other side of the town and there's not a sick person left. Just Isn't that amazing? amazing. Yeah. Without a doubt, Jesus was the most successful healer of all time. His miracles were acts of compassion and justice. But Jesus wanted those miracles and his ministry to send a message to the entire world. He was trying to tell the truth about God. And then there's a couple of examples that make you wonder. Maybe he wasn't always so kind and gentle. Twice during... And, and the passages, passages we're going to look at now are John 2, 13 to 17, Matthew 21, 12 to 16, Mark 11, 15 to 19, and Luke 19, 45 to 48. We, 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 don't, we don't have time to read them, but we're, those are the passages. Twice during his ministry, Jesus cleansed the temple in Jerusalem. Only John recorded the first cleansing. That's the one in John 2. The three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, recorded the cleansing that occurred at the end of his ministry. And Ellen White had some interesting words to say about that. Dennis? Desire, age, Desire of Ages 591, first paragraph. Three years before, the rulers of the temple had been ashamed of their flight before the command of Jesus. They had since wondered at their own fears and their unquestioning obedience to a single humble man. They had felt that it was impossible for their undignified... Uh, they had <laughs> felt that it was impossible for their undignified surrender to be repeated. Yet they were now more terrified than before <laughs> and in greater haste to obey his command. There was none who dared question his authority. Priests and tra traitors fled from his presence, driving their cattle before them. Wow. I, I have to smile every time I read that passage. You can just visualize that picture. There's one person, one person, and they, they can't get away fast enough. But you know, it's God. Hmm? But it's God. Yeah. Yes, that's a major important point. <laughs> well, so much of Jesus' ministry was filled with kindness and compassion and empathy for the people that it might seem completely out of character for him to cleanse the temple in a, what appears to be using force. The large area of the temple courtyard was supposed to be for the purpose of providing a place for Gentiles to come and observe the religious practices that God had ordained. They were supposed to learn about God by coming to this courtyard. But the Jews thought that salvation was only for them, not for any Gentiles. So they turned that area into a marketplace and a place for the exchange of currencies. The temple tax could only be paid using the temple shekel and they charged outrageous exchange rates to purchase those shekels. Do we have any idea how long that took place before Jesus' time? Is there anything Before anywhere? Jesus' time. Yeah, where they were using the temple yeah. courtyard, the outer courtyard. Yeah, uh, not that I know business. of. business. Not that I know of. So we learned about it first right there. Yeah. Yeah. But, but that demand, the necessity of it allowed for it to kind of happen. Yeah. They brought in hundreds of over animals. Oh yes, quite a period of time. Right. Yeah. They just got used to it. Forgot they just the whole thing. While the Jewish leaders and those who were conducting their businesses in the temple courtyard fled from Jesus, the children, the sick, and those who wanted to hear Jesus crowd, crowded in. They recognized that Jesus was a prophet. And I don't know about your experience, but if a grown man becomes angry, it's usually the children that flee fastest, right? There was nothing for the children to be afraid of. Nothing for them to be afraid of. So are you suggesting that it wasn't a forceful, um, well, angry I'm, 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 Jesus? Well, I'm letting that, you think that, about that. That, that, sent them, that forced them it, it out. Was, it wasn't just anger by an ordinary grown man. Clearly, it was something more than that. Maybe he said, you kids, you all just wait here for a minute. I'll be right back. <laughs> I suppose <laughs> oh, a lot of speculation. <laughs> yeah, I I am so that looking forward. Interesting. Using I'm, your imagination. Yeah, you know. I, I'm Where so. Where would you have been? Yeah, I would. We I'm, were there that day. I'm so looking forward to seeing this all in 3D living color. <laughs> Jackie, I think you're next. Luke 19, verse 47 and 48. Every day Jesus taught in the temple. 
the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders of the people wanted to kill him. But they could not find a way to do it because all the people kept listening to him and not wanting to miss a single word. <laughs> and can you, you, know, one, you know the story. One time they sent, they sent the temple guards, go and arrest that man, bring him back here. See, if, if you go and arrest him, then we won't look like we're the bad guys. Bring him over here. And once we have him in our custody, then we can yeah. deal with him. And what happened? The guards came back and said, man, nobody ever talked like this guy. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Ken... Yeah. It's not like in our church where you have to be asked to talk in front of the church. No. So he just stood up and... Well, there's a huge courtyard. And there were one large area, particularly on what would be the north... Let's see. North side. Yeah, the north side, where there were covered areas. And they were there specifically for teaching and so forth like that. And I'm sure Jesus just found his... Very early in the morning, he was there preaching, and before the people came out to try to arrest him or anything, he already had a big crowd around him. Well, our churches today will never become unfair marketplaces. At least I certainly hope so. But, we, but do we ever at least unconsciously exclude outsiders from our services or our fellowship gatherings? Wow. It is almost impossible for us to comprehend how someone carrying out the compassionate, loving ministry of Jesus Christ could lead to the hatred, jealousy, and injustice that he received from the Jewish leaders. But they recognized that if the nation accepted him, it would destroy their religious system. Didn't they recognize what the scripture says in Isaiah 53, 3-6? You know, that's where it talks about the lamb coming and being offering himself and so forth. While Christians clearly recognize that those words are a prediction of the work of Jesus, the Jewish people still claim that they, by twisting the words, they can apply to, these apply to the sufferings that they have endured as a nation. Why do you suppose that in the middle of that passage in Isaiah 53 it says, all the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God? Do Christians ever suggest that God poured out his wrath on Jesus as our substitute? That's a it's major... The, from the pulpit every week. Yep. Major, major, major doctrine for many Christian churches. But we know, I mean, clearly we know that God understood from a human perspective, perspective what it means to suffer misunderstanding, evil, and injustice. And Hebrews 4 verse 5 talks about that. Let's see if we can look at that. Our high priest is not one who cannot feel sympathy for our weaknesses, on the contrary, we have a high priest who was tempted in every way that we are, but did not sin. While it is true that the death of Jesus was a substitution for us, this can be greatly misunderstood. As we seek to correctly present the three angels' messages, we must do so in the context of the great controversy over God's character and his form of government. The life and death of Jesus answered the great questions and accusations that Satan had brought against the government of God and his character as a God of love. That was far more than a substitution. Margaret? But the, <clears throat> but the plan of redemption had yet a broader and deeper pur purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded but it was also to vindicate the character of God before the universe. To this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligences of other worlds, as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when just before his crucifixion he said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. This is from John twelve thirty one and 32. And you notice that she left out a word from the King James Version there. All men. In King James it says, draw all men. And she left it out because it's not in the original language. And there was mm. an italics in the original King James. Yeah. And because it's not just men, it's the whole it's universe. All. It's yeah. the entire universe. You want to read the rest of that for us? Yeah. The act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man 
would not only make heaven accessible to men but, and women and women, but before all the universe, it would justify God and his son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the per- perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and the results of sin. This is Alan G. White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 62. 68. 68, 2, 2, and to 69. Yeah, thank you. Wow, fantastic. Jim? And some more. By coming to dwell with us, Jesus was to reveal God both to men and to angels. Pretty amazing when you think about it. Yeah. Not alone for his earthborn children was this revelation given. Our little world is the lesson book of the universe. God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of redeeming love, is the theme into which angels desire to look, and it will be their study throughout endless ages. We've often thought that was for our study, yes, the endless ages, but even the angels, angels will marvel from now through eternity at what God did. And that's from Ellen White in Desire of Ages 19. Well, how do you fit those words from Ellen White with our lesson this week? God has given in his word decisive evidence that he will punish the transgressors of his law. Wow. Those who flatter themselves that he is too merciful to execute justice upon the sinner have (coughs) only to look to the cross of Calvary. The death of the spotless Son of God testifies that the wages of sin is death that every violation of God's law must receive its just retribution. Christ the sinless became sin for man. He bore the guilt of transgression and the hiding of his father's face until his heart was broken and his life crushed out. All this sacrifice was made that sinners might be redeemed. In no other way could man be freed from the penalty of sin. And every soul that refuses to become a partaker of the atonement provided at such a cost must bear in his own person the guilt and punishment of transgression. Wow. That's from Great Controversy, page 539 through 540. Now let's think about that for a minute. Sin is deadly. The Bible says so. It is its own punishment. It is important to recognize that Jesus died because of his father's withdrawal from him as they had planned and not from his father's punishment of him. And what does the verse say, the very familiar verse? At about three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud shout. He is on the cross. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why did you punish me? Why are you punishing me? No, why did you abandon me? Why did you abandon me? So why did Ellen White write uh, that he will punish the transgressor of the law? Well, Well, he bore the guilt and hiding. Let me see. Go back here. And and lots of and lots of things in that paragraph. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I, and the way I look at it is, I think that he she just says that God knew that sin would have its own consequences. Well, it depends on how you interpret the wrath of God. We talked about it a minute ago. Is God directly, and, and punishment is a, a, a word that often is translated as a direct, you know, God does this. But uh, it's really, as we've been reading through there, he, uh, he withdraws. Yeah. He gives up uh, Romans 1. And uh, so uh, the wrath of God, he gives them over mm-hmm. to things. So... In in a way, it's it's the same thing, but you're interpreting wrath differently. Yes, very differently. Well, how well, well has the Seventh Day Adventist Church in our day done at preaching to the poor, the needy, those suffering injustice, etc.? Are there ways in which we can cooperate with the government and/or other groups, such as the Salvation Army, trying to reach out to such people? Adra does, I think, don't they? Yeah, and and our local. Uh, yeah. I think I'm working in a place where we do that every day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In this lesson, we have touched on Christ's love, compassion, healing ministry, and reaching the needs of the needy, while at the same time remembering the terrible injustices that he suffered at the hands of the Jewish leaders. What should we learn from those two very different aspects of his ministry? 
the cruel treatment, etc. We know that part of the reason Jesus came, a big part of the reason he came, is to answer those questions that were already abroad in the entire universe. There's accusations and questions that have been raised by, by Satan. Some have suggested that Jesus was trying to get the Jewish people to carry out a jub- jubilee rest- restoration. What would be a jubilee restoration? All the press go free. Debts are forgiven. Land returned to the original mm-hmm. owner. What would happen to the Pharisees and Sadducees of Jesus' day if that happened? It would equalize. <laughs> yeah. They'd lose a lot. <coughs> there is little evidence that such a restoration was ever actually fully carried out by the Jewish people. In fact, the Jewish leaders in Jesus' day had devised a way to, of circumventing the mandates of the ce- Jubilee celebration by their own legal system. It is that part of why, is that part of why in Luke 419 Jesus seemed to suggest that they should go back to the true Jubilee celebration? Well, the challenges of this lesson are something, um, and we're running out of time. How could we carry out this healing and teaching ministry of Jesus Christ? Clearly, we cannot perform his miracles, so what can we do? There's a few words. Gordon? The world needs today what it needed 1900 years ago, a revelation of Christ. It is only through the grace of Christ that the work of restoration, physical, mental, and spiritual, can be accomplished. That's from the Ministry of Healing. And continuing on the next page, the object of the medical missionary work, that is the holistic ministry, is to point sin-sick men and women to the man of Calvary. So, are we as a church reaching out to heal people physically, mentally, and spiritually? To make man whole is the motto, anyway. Of, of our institution. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and, I mean... Is it the motto of our church? No. It, it, it's it's a, one of the things we talk about, but it's, it is specifically a, a part of Loma Linda University. Yeah. So, and of course, this is a place where we're, we're big into healing and so forth. I mean, look at several of us around this table are into professional healing. Um, But the object, anyway, are we alert every day to any opportunities that come our way to correctly correctly represent Christ when we deal with patients, when we deal with people on the street and so forth like this? Most of us have opportunity every day if you pray for that. It's shocking to see that prayer answered, at least for me. We're running out of time. It's yours. Our kind and loving Heavenly Father, challenge us every day by reminding us the words of this lesson, how we can reach out to those around us. We know that you intended for a great work to be done. We are far behind what you asked, and we understand at least some of the reasons why. Forgive us where we may have failed, but encourage us and show us the way to move forward is our prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.